I am very fortunate and very grateful to be in this amazing space. It feels like community. I, I'm seeing some new faces, meeting some new people, reconnecting, seeing some of my colleagues, which I don't often get to see too often. Um, but it was really great to be um, reconnected with a few of our community leaders in a small, intimate conversation that we had just a few minutes ago, which is why we're running a little bit behind here. And, and I know Brent's gonna share a couple of thoughts around that, so I don't wanna steal his thunder, but I just wanna express my gratitude openly to those who participated in that group who gave us, at the federal level, kind of a, a small glimpse of, of what they experience every day and uh, what, they, what they have to grapple with and, 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 and to see the good work happening. I also recognize quite a, a familiar faces here. I see my long-term good friend, uh, Elutra. I see, I see Soren and I got to, to meet for the second time, David and Devante as well. Uh, Mark, where's Mark at? There he is. Mark and I go way back, maybe 12, 13 years ago in the YMCA days when he was an outreach worker and so was I in Chicago. Um, and as I mentioned, Soren and I were, were at Red Chicago not too long ago uh, until DOJ kind of stole me away from the city. But um, as we begin our program, uh, we'd like to really fully express our gratitude to each one of you for taking the time to join us uh, this morning, uh, especially as we celebrate two years of CVI investments. We feel very privileged uh, to be here and to be in a position that we are in the Department of Justice in our efforts to elevate the good work that you are all doing. Today we're joined by some amazing community leaders, some that I've actually mentioned I had the chance to meet before, and new ones, uh, as Ben and others that I had the pleasure of meeting this morning briefly and I'm looking forward to following up with. And I, th I can't, as I look at this group, I, I can't think of a better example of what real community and what really real village looks like. And I wish that I could say that's the case everywhere we travel. Reeve and I were just here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but we had a, a small sample from talking to our chief to hear what they're doing on, on his front uh, to just some of the local organizations here. And so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce both a very close friend and colleague, someone uh, that has taken his role very serious, uh, who is new in some extent in his new position, but not new to DOJ, not new to the work in itself. <clears throat> I, I want to really take a moment here to acknowledge the good work that Brent Cohen has done in his lifetime to support people who have been impacted by the justice system, but also in finding ways to bring healing and elevating good leaders across the country around this work. So without any further ado, I wanna introduce, um, and please help me welcome uh, our Acting Attorney General, Brent Cohen. I almost tripped and went down. That would have been a great way to start. Anyway, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Eddie, so much for uh, that introduction and um, for your leadership, not just at the Department of Justice over the last several years, but in the field of community violence intervention over many years. Uh, really grateful for your work. And a huge thanks to our hosts, Chantel and Rachel and Paul. Uh, you'll hear from uh, Chantel and Rachel in just a moment. Thanks for having us here at Urban Family. It's a privilege to share the podium with uh, with the three of you, with Chantel and, and Rachel and Eddie, uh, and to join the dedicated professionals in the audience who are working so hard to reduce violence in Seattle and in King County, and to bring hope and opportunity to the communities of this great city and this great county. I want to acknowledge the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Washington, Tessa Gorman, who is here with us this morning. Tessa, thank you for your leadership in the district and for your support of community-based partnerships. I also want to thank my friend and great colleague, the director of our National Institute of Justice, Dr. Nancy Levine. You'll get to hear more from Nancy in just a moment, but she heads up the research division of the Department of Justice 
and has been central to building our base of knowledge about community violence intervention strategies. And let me also acknowledge Catherine Brown, who leads our Office of Communications at OJP. Her and her team have been working hard to shine light on the amazing work being done by CVI professionals here in Seattle and King County and in communities across the country. Um, I'm grateful that she's able to join me here today. And finally, let me thank all of the partners in the room, including our law enforcement professionals and partners uh, from Des Moines and from Kent. We, are, we know as we build a community infrastructure, a community safety infrastructure that is going to take investments in community and it's going to take partnership with law enforcement. And I'm grateful to see uh, that here in, in, in spirit and in body today. So thank you. Despite what my voice might suggest, I am feeling really energized to be here this morning. <laughs> Earlier this morning, Eddie and I had the chance to meet with some of the exceptional leaders who are implementing community violence intervention programs locally, uh, including the directors of some outstanding community organizations here in Seattle, along with folks from the state of Washington, all of whom bring such rich experience and an incredible wealth of knowledge and insights both about the challenges their communities are facing and importantly, perhaps more importantly, about what it takes to meet those challenges. During our roundtable discussion, we had the privilege of hearing in very personal terms about the stakes in this work. Local leaders told us how violence deeply impacted their own lives from an early age and how community violence intervention programs and the hope that came with it helped them find purpose in direction and envision a more hopeful future for themselves. We have an obligation as government officials, as civic leaders, as professionals serving our communities to take a multifaceted approach to preventing and reducing violence. And that includes lifting up CVI programs and helping to take them to scale so that others with similar experiences have access to the same kind of support and opportunities so that they too are able to find this, able to feel the same kind of hope. And we simply can't do this life-saving CVI work without credible messengers. Like so many people in this room, your lived experience gives you a connection to the people of your communities that no one else can claim. And that connection, that connection is critical to reducing violence and saving lives, and often to preventing shootings before they even occur. I particularly want to thank the dedicated frontline workers who put their lives on the line and put themselves in harm's way to support and protect others. Thank you for doing that. There's no question that you are the driving force behind community violence intervention. And I'm proud that I can be here representing an administration and a Department of Justice that has put its full support behind you. CVI strategies form a centerpiece of the President's Safer America Plan and the Justice Department's comprehensive strategy for reducing violent crime. Through, and through us, the Office of Justice Programs, DOJ has made historic investments in CVI programs. I'll add here, we've also revised our mission statement at the Office of Justice Programs to include a particular focus on lifting up communities as co-producers of public safety and justice. I don't know how many of you are familiar with DOJ, but things like mission statements don't get changed quickly. Uh, and so it's really a testament to the, to the amount of focus that this work has at DOJ and to the high regard with which we consider this and the critical nature that we believe this um, CBI programs uh, provide. So right now, we're, we're here today to commemorate the two-year anniversary of the Department of Justice's Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, or CVIPI. It really rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> Since the program's launch, we've made an unprecedented federal investment, totaling nearly $200 million to support community violence intervention, programs, and research, with much of this funding coming courtesy of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. 
These investments have provided direct funding to promising and effective local programs, and they also tap some of these same organizations, like CCYJ, to reach smaller community-based groups that are even closer to the communities and individuals most impacted by violence. And they're doing this through micro-grants and technical assistance that can help build organizational capacity and sustain their work for the long term. To date, over the first two years, we have directly funded 76 organizations in 29 states and territories. And these grants are reaching communities across the country that are affected by violence, from Alabama to Minnesota, and from Miami to right here in Seattle. The supporting efforts in our largest cities, in smaller metro areas, and in rural communities, many of them led by community-based organizations and others as part of city-led collaboratives. And we're supporting seven organizations, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that serve as intermediaries and that are providing funding and hands-on assistance to smaller community-based organizations to help them access resources and build their capacity to grow and sustain their work in the long term. Now, it's no mistake that we're here in Seattle, in King County, to commemorate this anniversary. Over the past two years, Seattle, King County, and the state of Washington have come to embody our approach in action. Thanks to the commitment of so many people in this room today, we're seeing what's possible when partners come together across sectors to build out a community safety infrastructure that is up to the challenge of tackling gun violence. The Center for Children and Youth Justice is tapping into federal resources to deliver direct services to their community and to build the capacity of outstanding grassroots organizations in the city. And we're so fortunate that our partners from the Washington Department of Commerce have embraced this effort and are working closely with us to lift up the vital work that CVI leaders are doing across the state. And we're not done yet. As we celebrate two years since the launch of CVIPI, we're gearing up for a new round of funding. The investments that we've made thus far are part of a longer term strategy to expand these approaches and seed this work across the country so that CVI becomes a core component of the community safety infrastructure. And I am pleased that tomorrow, the White House will have more good news to share about additional investments that we'll be announcing and making to support CVI programs nationwide. Now it's important to note that part of the reason we're able to make this commitment is because we've seen the promise that community violence intervention holds for our country. Thanks to the successes that dedicated CVI professionals like many of you have helped to achieve, homicide is down nationally. And dramatically, in fact, with just a report released earlier this week showing 2023 experiencing the largest single year decline in the last 20 years. I know that CVI strategies have played an important role in making this possible. But it's also true that not every city has experienced the decline equally, and not every part of every city has experienced that decline equally. So we have much, much more to do, including right here in Seattle. We know our work is far from over, but I remain convinced that comprehensive local strategies that include CVI offer real promise for reduced violence and preliminary data for 2024 suggests that Seattle is headed in the right direction this year as well. We all know that violence is a deep and complex problem with no single cause and no single solution. There's no one size fits all strategy, but that's the promise of CVI. It's a community driven approach that grows from the ground up both led by and engaging those with the greatest stakes in the outcome. While our national level initiative is only two years old, community violence intervention is not new, certainly not new to many of you. And it is really, at its core, a local story. Community leaders have been pioneering this work on the ground for decades, long before 
there was investment at scale from the federal government. <clears throat> and very often you were doing this work without the resources or the recognition that you deserve. We know, and you know better than anyone, that this is an all hands on deck effort. Each of us has to stake a claim, police and prosecutors, community and faith based organizations, educators and healthcare professionals, government leaders, and community members themselves all working together to widen our vision of community safety. To envision safety not just as an absence of crime, but as the presence of opportunity. Our hope here is to create a public safety landscape that puts the community at the center. One that recognizes your work as a critical complement to our traditional justice system approaches. We are very proud to be your partners. And I know I speak for my colleagues when I say that we are excited for what lies ahead in our work together. Thank you. Thank you for everything you are doing for our communities. Thank you for the difference you are making in the lives of the people you touch. And thank you for joining us today. So thank you so much, Brent, for that. Please give him another hand of applause. And the hand of applause is not because of his mar remarkable comments. It's really because uh, he wasn't feeling that well a couple of days ago, and yet he was so committed to come here that he took a five and a half hour flight to, to come out here. This is how important it was for him to, to be here. Um, and again, thank you, Brent. Like we, we see your efforts day in, day out. The next person I wanted to introduce to the podium is another a great friend and colleague. Uh, she just came out of a, an amazing event that I was able to bear witness in Pittsburgh as NIJ was convening their second annual conference in such a long time uh, because of COVID and other issues. But it was incredible to see CVI at front center at this conference as well. And I'm not gonna steal her thunder, but I am, I am at, at all of the way that our director for NIJ, Nancy Levine, has moved in the space, how she has pushed the envelope and has expanded um, the way that we are trying to build the bench of researchers in the CVI community and related fields. So without any further ado, I want to introduce my good friend, Nancy Levine, director of NIJ. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you so much to our hosts at Urban Family and to all of you here today. I'm so short. Uh, <laughs> um, I have the unenviable task of addressing all of you today on the topic of data and research. It's scintillating, I know, but, but here's the thing. Research is really important. Evaluation is really important. If for no other reason that rigorous, empirical evidence speaks to power, right? I mean, that's what the policymakers want to see. Show me the impact, you know? Like, what's the cost benefit? Like, that's what the decision makers want to see, okay? And if I didn't believe in research and the, the power and the impact of good evaluation, I wouldn't be in this job. But here's the rub. We're talking about community-based violence intervention efforts, right? And when you talk about that and you talk about research, the two are like oil and water. Why? Because there's a very long history of researchers primarily in academic institutions that conduct their research at an arm's length and defend that by saying, well, we have to be objective, right? And it ends up being research on communities rather than research with community. And when I took this role at NIJ, one of the primary reasons I wanted to be in it was to preach about a different kind of research. And that's what I call inclusive research. And that's research that takes the time to engage with the people closest to the issue or problem that we're talking about, right? 
the true experts, the people with lived experience, but also the practitioners with their own professional expertise, getting as close to the ground as possible. And we're trying to do that in a lot of different ways at NIJ. Um, and I think that our approach, I hope, is adding value to community-based violence intervention and prevention efforts across the country. First and foremost, we're really requiring that all of our grantees, we, we do most of our work by seeding research grants and in, in the CVI space, these are primarily evaluations in partnership with the community. Um, but we're requiring them that they really engage with folks on the ground. We're, in, we're requiring them to engage authentically. Uh, we're also requiring them to use what we call mixed methods, or uh, put a different way, combining the numbers that the policymakers want to see with the narratives, again, the lived experience, the people on the ground. And when you combine those two, that's where you really have the powerful evidence, right? Because you've got the hard data, but then you ground truth it, right? With people who say, you know, I'm not sure that number's right. Let's explore it in a different way. I can't tell you how many times I've, in my own research, found that I would have drawn erroneous conclusions if I didn't go back to the people who helped generate that data to understand it. And importantly, to understand the implications of those research findings for making these programs better, right? More powerful. Now, look, I mean, you all are toiling away trying to cobble together resources to do the important work that you're doing, right? And I recognize that there are funders who want to see the numbers. And even, I, dare I say, uh, at the Office of Justice Programs, we too want to see the numbers and we run you through the ringer and we want to see, it almost feels like auditing, right? How many people have you served and what have they received, this and that, the other. And I just want to say, there's another way to think about evaluation and that's evaluation in the moment to learn how you can make the program better as you're implementing it. And that's called action research, and it's something that we really want to support uh, from where we sit in Washington, but also through the, the people that we're funding and, and supporting on the ground in communities across the country. Uh, so we're supporting a lot of that work. We're also supporting evaluations of a lot of emerging programs and ones that you all have been working on for a long time. I'm just going to lift up three examples. One that I'm really excited about that we awarded last year um, was on a healing-based and trauma-informed intervention. I mean, you don't make up these types of programs from Washington, D.C., right? These are programs that are developed at the, gra the grassroots level, recognizing that community violence intervention work is really difficult and that even the, the people who are working to reduce trauma are experiencing trauma themselves. So you need a really holistic approach to that kind of work, and we need to be able to evaluate that so we can lift up those lessons learned and share them with others. We're also supporting evaluations of hospital-based interventions and going further upstream. Uh, diversion opportunities for youth who are um, apprehended with loaded weapons, right, so that they're not incarcerated, but that we reach them early on. And then overall, we're also providing tra t training and technical assistance resources to help local research partners to build capacity on the ground so that you all can be doing your own data collection, your own measurement, and your own assessment of what works. Um, so with that, I'll just close by saying we want to be a resource to you um, when you're thinking about data and evaluation, even if you don't want to be, but perhaps your funders are asking you, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, again, for the wonderful work you're doing. Uh, Lot, that's a lot that I wish I could say right now, given our Pittsburgh event, but we don't have a lot of time. I just, I just, wanted to, I just want people in the audience to know that I, I hope, some of you might not know me, but I hope you trust that there are good people um, at the Department of Justice who are really trying to lift up the voices and build the evidence for the skeptics that are out there about the importance of this work. And 
I would say at the local level, you have a couple champions who are sitting in this room today, or a few champions, but two that we'll be highlighting in just a second, who have had the very distinct pleasure of getting to know better, more so in the last three weeks than since we started funding this you know, organization. Um, I, I wanna take a moment to just recognize Rachel for going far and beyond uh, your call and on top of the work that you have to do every single day, here you are working with our local partners to really help accommodate our request to be able to host this event. And so without any further ado, I want to introduce who I would like to call my good friend, Rachel uh, Sotili, who is the executive president of CCYJ uh, and one of, our, one of two grantees that she is holding uh, with us as, as well. So thank you, Rachel. I'm going to pass the baton to you. Thank you. What an honor it is. Okay, I'm tall. <laughs> I'm worth the heel. So what, it, what an honor it is to welcome the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Assistant Attorney General, Acting Assistant Attorney General Brent Cohen. I don't think anyone introduced you uh, special policy, uh, senior policy advisor, Eduardo Bocanegra, Eddie, as we all know him, uh, and other visionaries from the U.S. Department of Justice here to Seattle. As Eddie said, my name is Rachel Satilli, and I serve as the president and CEO of the Center for Children and Youth Justice. And along with my colleagues, uh, William Hairston, I believe he's in the house, and Nicholas Oakley, uh, he's there. Um, we're just delighted to be a part of this amazing event and so excited about the intermediary role that CCYJ will play in this historic initiative that we're talking about today. In recent years, both King County and the city of Seattle began partnering with community-based organizations in a public health approach to reducing community violence. Where these initiatives have come together, CCYJ has been providing capacity building and support and training and technical assistance that is central to our mission. The importance of these two jurisdictions and their leadership in developing our area's community violence intervention, the city and the county, their efforts cannot be overstated. And there's so much more to do. Community-based organizations operating in this field have deep roots in our communities, and their heroic efforts to end the cycle of cycles of gun violence draw upon hard-won wisdom gained through lived experience. But until recently, too much of this work has happened at the margins of our state's public policy, public safety efforts, often staffed by volunteers, usually with little to no funding, and almost always denied the recognition their contributions merit. The statistics show the sad price of this oversight. While elsewhere in our nations, as AAG uh, Cohen said, uh, have seen, have made long term investments in C CDI are seeing historic reductions in gun homicides. Our rates continue to rise, though this year is promising, nearly 30% increase in 2023 to 2022. And we do see some promising uh, trends this year. Fortunately, today's meeting is evidence that King County community violence practitioners are finally embarking upon the long overdue period of growth not only in the community level outreach and intervention that is the substance of their work, but also in the hard effort in building the infrastructure, they will need to operate at their highest level over time. This means enhancing organizational capacities like developing internal financial structures, controls and policies, defining protocols that ensure practitioners understand and adhere to intervention models, and establishing data collection procedures that allow them to track, measure, and study their outcomes. It also means building and strengthening a community of CVI practitioners so they can coordinate, collaborate, aggravate, aggravate, aggregate, <laughs> aggregate, and sustain their success. This work is crucial not only because of the lives it promises to save, but it also recognizes the importance of centering and strengthening communities that have long been overlooked and disempowered. Reducing community violence requires more than interventions at key moments, which are, of course, important. 
CVI practitioners must also be empowered to act over the long term as mentors who recognize individuals' potential and as advocates who can facilitate and access and provide, facilitate access to essential resources like education and training, behavioral health services, and even in some cases, relocation assistance. We can never lose sight of the tragic toll that violence brings us here today. But we must all begin paying more attention to the new set of statistics that promise in time to brighten our horizon. Like the number of participants graduating from high school or receiving counseling to address his histories of trauma or reductions in food insecurity and increased access to job preparation. This is an all hands on deck day today. It's also a new opportunity for all of us with the united purpose, whether at the community, county, state, or federal level, to be joined by our state's businesses and philanthrop philanthropic communities. Building up King County's CVI ecosystem promises a tremendous payoff and in increased levels of safety and shared well-being, but we will need everyone's help to see it through. I'm excited to announce the four organizations selected for BJA sub-award funding and capacity building support. They include our host this morning, Urban Family. The other three are Pro Se Potential, the bumper. The Black Rose Collective, David Picard. <laughs> and Freedom Project, Blaise Vincent. <laughs> Please join me once again in congratulating their leaders and staff for their dedication to making our community safer. The Center for Children and Youth Justice looks forward to continuing to be a partner with these organizations and an ally in this critical, important process, not only today, but in the weeks, months, and years to come. And I am so pleased that my first responsibility in this role is to introduce our friends from Urban Family, the organization sharing their beautiful home with us this morning. Chantel and Paul Patu know the needs of young people and families in their community and share a vision for South Seattle, King County, of a healthy, vibrant community where youth and families feel safe, connected, and cared for. Under their leadership, Urban Family has created a distinctive space for youth and emerging young adults who are at a heightened risk of community violence. Their dedicated staff here in the house today walk alongside these individuals moving them, inspiring, and supporting them to make better choices, to fulfill their potential, and pay their gifts forward to future generations. I am honored to introduce Urban Family's Executive Director, Chantal Patu. I am short. <laughs> Thank you so much. Where? There we go. <sighs> Hi, everyone. My name is Chantel Patu, and I am the proud executive director and co-founder of Urban Family. We are a grassroots organization dedicated to reducing and eliminating gun violence and the devastating effects of gun violence in our King County communities. We stand shoulder to shoulder with our community partners, Community Passageways, Southeast Network, the YMCA, Freedom Project, Progress Pushers, and many more in this critical work of, violence, of community violence interruption. This is not merely a job, it's a calling. Our work touches lives, transforms communities, and shapes futures. Yet too often, our efforts remain invisible, our stories untold. Allow me to share a personal story, one close to my heart. 
There was once a young woman, just 16, lost in the world of hardship. Grappling with homelessness, gang involvement, life dealt her a difficult hand, leaving scars both visible and unseen. But beneath her tough exterior, there was a spark, a yearning for something better. One day, this young woman found her way into our program. Her anger and defiance were a shield, protecting a weary heart that longed for understanding, a listening ear, and above all, love. We saw past the facade, recognizing the lost child within, and we opened our arms to her. Through countless challenges and setbacks, we stood by her side. A constant source of support. We offered her shelter, guidance, and a sense of belonging, and we became her family, her safe harbor. We picked her up when she stumbled, we bandaged her wounds, and we welcomed her into our home. We walked with her through the, the darkness of addiction, offering a safe space, unconditional love, and a glimpse at a brighter future. Today, that same young woman is a beacon of hope, a testament to her resilience. She's a thriving adult, a wonderful parent, and a pillar in our community. And she's overcome extraordinary adversity, transforming her life and inspiring countless others. With a bachelor's degree in education and a master's degree on the horizon, she now dedicates her life to teaching, nurturing the next generation. The same warmth and care she once received, she gives back. Her story is the heartbeat of Urban Family. It shows that even in the face of overwhelming challenges, hope can bloom. At Urban Family, we ignite the spark of potential within underserved brown and black communities and brown and black youth, empowering them to become strong self-aware and impactful members of our society. We build safe havens, fostering connections and equipping them to navigate the critical journey from youth to young adult. We cultivate a transformative environment where our core values of mentorship and life coaching, resilience, leadership, and impact guide our every action. We believe in the inherent potential of every young person equipping them with tools and resources they need to thrive. We foster deep connections through meaningful, meaningful guidance, nurturing self-discovery, and goal achievement. Urban Family is more than an organization. We are a lifestyle. A way of life where we are committed to fostering safe, healthy, and thriving communities. We believe that every individual, regardless of their background, deserves the opportunity to reach their full potential. Our mission to weave a web of care and support around black and brown communities by providing positive youth programs and family support and neighborhood safety is something my team does every day. And now it's time to shine light on the invisible heroes who are working tirelessly to combat gun violence. It's time to recognize the transformative power of community violence intervention. I say this quote every time I speak. A child who was not embraced by the village will burn it down to fill its warmth. I'll say that one more time. A child who was not embraced by the village will burn it down to fill its warmth. This African proverb serves as both a warning and a plea. It is a call to action, urging us to create communities where every individual feels valued and connected. Let us not wait for the flames of despair to engulf our communities. Let us be a village that embraces every child, that offers warmth and belonging. Let us work together tirelessly and passionately to build a future where every young person feels seen, heard, and loved. For in the end, it's not just about saving lives, it's about creating lives worth living. It's about building a world where every child has the opportunity to thrive, to contribute, and to leave their mark on this world. This is why we created Urban Family which means city family. The city and the community are responsible for the health and well-being of our families. They make up our community. They add to our great nation. This is who we are. We are all urban family. And together as a family, 
we can build a nation where every child, every family, and every community feel safe, connected, and cared for. Thank you. So I, I, I called your names out, but didn't introduce you. So uh, starting with Billy, if you can just do the really quickly name and, and title type of introduction, and then I'm gonna come back down the line and ask you about what drives you to the work. But we're just gonna do, we're gonna start short. Sorry, okay, I was told on my introductions to go no shorter than five minutes and no longer than six, so I'll try to. Now, uh, I'm, uh, I'm William Frank Harrison III, but everybody just calls me Billy. Uh, I'm the director of the impact programs at Center for Children and Youth Justice. Uh, most of you guys know us as CCYJ. Uh, the impact programs, that includes our uh, school engagement work, our statewide Becca Task Force work, our CVI work, which is our link, which is our group and gang violence reduction model that's funded by BJA, uh, as well as our county uh, gun violence reduction work that's uh, supporting the Regional Peacekeepers Collective. Um, and then we also partner with our policy team on our J-Way work, which is our Justice for Washington Youth. Um, that's our juvenile justice uh, policy and advocacy group. Clap it up for Billy. <laughs> Good to be here. I heard my wife's name and she said, you, there, <laughs> now. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm the co-founder of Urban Family uh, and also director of strategy and innovation. Um, it is my honor to serve uh, the folks that uh, are on the front lines and really um, give them space to grow in this work. And so, it's really good to be here. Thank you. Paul Patu. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Appreciate you. Hello, everyone. Um, Billy did not prepare me for this. He just said, could you sit on this panel? And I said, Oh, sure. <laughs> he did me dirty, really. Um, my name is Francesca Madera. I am uh, go by Fran, or everyone calls me Fran. Um, and I am a juvenile probation counselor with King County, and I sit on the YouthLink team. Uh, I've been there since 2016. I looked it up. So 2016, I've been on the YouthLink team. Team two, um, team one was uh, pri a couple years prior, so I've been with the team for a long time. And thank you again. Thank you. What's up, family members? Uh, I say that because there's a lot of uh, people sitting in these seats um, that I've worked with for a long time. My name is Mark Rivers. I'm the deputy director at Community Passageways of our community safety teams, um, CVI work, right? Our ambassadors, outreach workers, as well as our critical incident response team where we go out every single day and we try to support our community um, by just showing up and being there and being some, somebody that they can call and count on. Okay, so that was the easy introduction. Yeah. We're gonna come back and, and the, the question to, to start us off as we start to get into the conversation is, what brings you to this work? What brings you to this work? Start with um, so for me, um, I was this work. Um, growing up without a mother and a father, um, and growing up at Granny's house, um, and I, I, my mother and my father, they came back into my life. But knowing what it feels like to be, to be left alone, to not have somebody to call, um, somebody not to fill in the gap, right? Um, and as I went through sports and those coaches, they became those adults that filled in the gap, for me, um, I want to show up for my community in the same way and fill in the gap for our young people who don't have nobody to call, who don't have nobody to take them to get something to eat, to challenge the, their way of thought. Um, and so I got an opportunity. Um, I didn't know it existed, actually. Um, for me, I'm, all, I'm always gonna support my friends and my family. And I got told uh, by my cousin, like he get paid to go into the hood and make sure that the youth are good. I said, you get paid for that? <laughs> Sign me up. Uh, and so Eleuthera um, was my first, first, first supervisor that gave me an opportunity uh, to come do this work. Well, my role 
world's a little, <coughs> excuse me, my world's a little different, but I can tell you the main reason that I continue to sit on the team is because I love the collaboration that I do with the community partners that are out there. Um, I can't tell you how many times, um, I mean, some of them are still here, some of them are not, but that 100% the collaboration that I have with them to be able to call a community partner and say, hey, so-and-so is in court, can you be there? Or to know that I can reach out to specific um, organizations that if a youth does need someone, that's who I'm hooking them up with because I trust those partners. And to me, I mean, I have some of you on speed dial and it is so, so helpful. So I appreciate the work that you guys do. <coughs> Mm. So, I come to this work, um, my parents are pillars in our community. My mother has given her life uh, to serving and educating people, and my father was also um, welcomed our people from the South Pacific Islands here and help them to rebuild their lives. Uh, while that was happening, um, I, uh, sibling, um, five siblings, was consumed with the neighborhood. Came from good stock, good influence, both my parents, and I still was consumed by the streets um, this work for me is about redeeming what I missed out on when I was younger and uh, the repairing the good name of my family because um, I was definitely, you know, I wasn't good news to my family. Uh, house shot up. Um, put my parents through a lot um, following the influence, the heavy influence of drugs, violence, gangs in my community. And so I come to the work um, in a redemptive sense and want young people to know um, that even though you are a product of your environment, you don't have to be. And with the right love and support, you can find your way. So, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop going after Paul, if we could adjust that, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, no, uh, been asked this question a lot in different groups lately. I, I think it's real simple. I, I, I like the word we, I stole from you earlier, Brent, um, indebted. Uh, I come to this work indebted. Uh, I, like Mark and so many of us in this room that do the work, um, I was the work. Like, I was the kid that everybody chased after. I was the kid that was stealing and kicking up dust and running around. Um, and then I just happened to have folks around me that, you know, when it was time to do the extra thing, just wouldn't let me do it. Um, just very indebted uh, to the people around me that pointed me uh, in a different direction. Um, not necessarily all the way out of the way, but you know, just stand over here while we go do this. So uh, just very much as I, I, I look into the work that comes to me as I'm indebted to the people that press me into the space, um, specifically in this space because of someone else and I recognize that and then I look to find ways to um, be that person um, for the next generation or for the next person. How do I um, serve in the same capacity that I was served in? Thanks, Billy. So I'll share too, because it's only fair if I ask you all to. Um, and I'll say, I, I got into the work of public service to begin with, um, having been through my own experiences of an exposure to uh, violence, particularly in high school, uh, and, and gangs and violence, and also really seeing um, how different young people were treated by the same system actors, depending on whether they were in honors and AP classes depending on how they dressed or who they looked, how they looked or who they hung out with. And having been uh, in a couple of different spaces, I was treated differently at different times, being the same person, but in different circumstances. And it really opened my eyes to the, the power of systems. It opened my eyes to the 
importance of giving young people opportunities consistently. Um, opened my eyes to a lot of other stuff too, but that's what motivated me to begin a career in public service to begin with. And so as I think about my own professional trajectory, right, which has included um, working in local government at New York City Department of Correction, New York City Probation, which if you would have told people when I was in high school I was at New York City Correction and New York City Probation, they would have laughed at you. Um, but having worked at the, at the local level in those agencies, uh, and now having worked in federal government a couple times uh, at the Office of Justice Programs, where we're funding communities, where we're funding law enforcement at the local level, where we're funding um, uh, research and statistical endeavors to really make sure that our nation's response to crime and violence is informed by evidence and not just because we're mad at people. We do a lot of stuff because we're mad at people. Um, and me as an individual being mad at somebody and what my individual response is versus what the country's system response should be shouldn't necessarily be one and the same because I hold our systems to a higher standard. Um, and so to be able to inform by best practice, to be able to inform with research and data is just so incredibly important. Uh, and so as we, as we transition here to the conversation about CVI, I shared with some of you this morning, um, this work for me, investing in CBI is so incredibly meaningful for me. And to be able to sit in this seat at this moment in time where we recognize the two-year anniversary of the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, the first ever federal investment at scale of CBI work, the first ever real acknowledgement and recognition of this local work that has been happening without recognition and without funding for so long. Um, and the emphasis on collaboration that we've placed on it and that we know all of you have placed on it is just incredibly meaningful. Um, and so as we, a few, a couple months ago, uh, my colleague Betsy Pearl uh, and I and my predecessor, Amy Solomon, uh, who was formerly the Assistant Attorney General at OJP, we released a white paper called Reimagining Justice at Justice. Um, Reimagining Justice at Justice. And it talked a little bit about what I mentioned earlier in terms of the mission statement change and elevating the role of communities as co-producers of public safety alongside our traditional justice system partners. It also talked about making our resources available to organizations that prior to this, and probably for some folks in this room, never considered yourselves potential grantees of the Department of Justice or potential sub-grantees of the Department of Justice or stakeholders of the Department of Justice. And the truth is you are, you are all of those. Uh, and so we really focus on how do we break down barriers to federal DOJ funding. One of, the, one of the strategies that we talk about in the paper, and that's evidence today, and being here in the space at Urban Family, and hearing from Paul and hearing from Chantel, is like this is reimagining justice at justice in action. It speaks to why we knew we needed to place the emphasis on community and to empower community leaders. Um, and so this is, this is reimagining justice at justice. And one core component of that was the intermediary model. And, I, and I'm, and I'm going to turn to you, Billy, here in just a moment, because I want you to talk a little bit about what CCYJ's role is in terms of being an intermediary. Uh, you're hoping to achieve through it. Uh, and, then, and then we'll turn to, to Paul to talk a little bit about what it feels like being a newly announced recipient on, on the other side of that. I'll try to be brief. I've been uh, thinking about this and trying to move our direction and how this works in our ability to be in service of community for our lane. Uh, when we talk about community ecosystem or CVI ecosystem, it's everyone has a role to play. And uh, the role that we kind of see for ourselves uh, in this space is, is kind of threefold. There's a number of different components to it. Um, one is kind of as a fiscal, right? Like how do we um, hold and or draw down funds that folks can access. As you guys talk about, this is the two year anniversary and all the white paper. We've been giving money to community based organizations that's federal dollars for multiple years, right? Like we have several partners in our uh, site based work that uh, are, are, are receiving federal dollars and we've been creative in how we've done that um, to allow them to have access. So being a fiscal. Uh, secondly, right, how do we do um, uh, capacity building and organizational development and things on the back end, which we've, we've also worked on and a number of different capacities, even in other grants as well, which uh, we continue to build up that component. And then as well as uh, our training piece, right? Like how do we um, 
how do we give the tools to the workforce, right, so that everybody has the same tools and the same baseline toolbox so that we're all operating on a consistent front. So it's not just uh, Mark being amazing at what he does or Trey being amazing at what he does, so then they're able to reach people, but then Billy goes out there and gets his ass kicked, right? Like, so how do we um, make sure everybody has the baseline tools? So one of the ways that we've done that is one through our site-based work by carrying model components and uh, having vendor contracts so people that can that do the work can lean into their passion and just do the work, and then we house all the data and all those, those components. Um, and then another way that we've done it is we've continue and can, will continue to build and work with Urban Family is our uh, back of house stuff in our capacity building, and that is our um, uh, Gina Cumbos and our compliance people and things like that really just coming down here, coming into the space, getting to work uh, with the Chantels and everybody of the, uh, of the world and really them leaning into the knife. Uh, especially one of the things that's tough about that is it's all new and it's all paperwork uh, and it feels like oppression probably right away, right? Like we think about audit, right? Like it's, it's terrible, but trying to help and put people in positions to be audit ready um, and, and, and not doing that, it feels hard. And so Chantel and Paul and those guys, they're very open there. Uh, their arms to us and just really embraced us as we've leaned into that space as well. And then with the training component, um, they're pillars of the community and they have partnerships and relationships with everyone else. So it allows us to then coordinate those trainings and bring multiple people into the fold. So that way we're working to have a baseline. Um, so everybody has the same tools to work with. So I got to go before Paul. So I'm very excited. Yeah, so <laughs> so um, wow. I believe that um, I believe that we've we've always had CEOs amongst us, executive directors amongst us, leaders amongst us, right? And so the brilliance of our community, we've always known who we are, but uh, to interface with the system um, has been the next evolution of our work and so for so long we're conditioned to believe the system is a certain way right and it produces a certain result and as leaders we've always uh, we, we have always had the confidence that these um, I got asked uh, one time by a CEO um, apartment community out of control they tried law enforcement they tried security they were burning money like the private private business um see him they're cutting the ribbon and they built this beautiful apartment complex and you know i looked at it, the first thing i thought of was the good that we can do because this is my neighborhood he built it in right and so i basically asked him of like hey uh this is a great facility and my, my, my imagination and vision, I love that you use that word, imagination. Um, we have to start imagining things differently. Um, but for him, he was like, uh, you know, I offered my, you know, support, and he was, he's basically like, oh, no, the, the community will take ownership of this, and it'll be just fine, right? He didn't know my neighborhood. <laughs> Within three months, assaults homicides, he, affordable housing, inadvertently put multiple families just looking for a place to stay, three different rival gangs in one neighborhood. He calls me uh, three months later and the first thing he says is, do you really think you can help us with these people? And I say, with all respect, sir, these people are my people. And yes, I have solutions if you're willing to learn. And so I think us reimagining uh, and then creating space, right? Dom's been a CEO since the streets, right? And giving opportunities to people that are already gifted and we're basically, and it's not even like, these are our tax dollars, right? <laughs> you're just redeploying our tax dollars to empower the people from our community to serve our kids. And so it isn't, is it, it isn't a stretch. Uh, CCYJ has played a major role in that they are teaching us the ways of the system so that we can, you know, get good credit. No, I'm playing. Uh, <laughs> get along without 
yeah. So, anyways, um, but thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. And I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you next. Uh, I was gonna say, James O.P. I cannot go after them. I <laughs> listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a monologue for a minute, and then I'm coming to you. Don't worry. Um, and then and then Mark, I've got a question for you after. But um, Paul, as you were you were talking about. Um, You know, thought he thought he could just do this in the community without knowing the community, and I mean that's something that we see all the time, even with the best of intentions. When I was at the New York City Department of Probation, we were doing, in my humble, not so humble opinion here, incredible work to really re envision what probation looked like in the city, to change the relationship between the New York City Probation Department and the communities most impacted by probation, to, to change the relationship between people on probation and the probation officers. I remember one of the first meetings, the probation officer was like, well, we have to call them offenders. Do you? Can you call them clients? Well, then it sounds like we're trying to help them. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, and so, you know, we tried to change the culture of the department and successfully did it and, and just so proud of the work that we did in New York City probation during those years. But there was a moment that stands out at me where I was sitting at this table and we were talking about the changes we were going to make because we had launched something called the Neighborhood Opportunity Network, which completely changed how probation showed up in community. And someone led the presentation, they said, and we're going to open it up on this street. And I lived in the South Bronx at the time. My wife had grown up in the South Bronx since high school. Um, you know, I was a transplant, but she wasn't. And I was like, well, has anybody talked to the community? Did we, do we know that the South Bronx is good with this? And, this? and not just the South Bronx, but this particular neighborhood in the South Bronx? And everybody was like, no, we, but it's a good thing. What, we're gonna, it's going to help. And I was like, yeah, it's going to help if the community is bought in if the community's here from the ground level, if they've got input into what that looks like, if they believe that this is really there for good. And so it spawned a whole effort where we had to change the way we thought about doing good for communities, because we had to do good for communities in partnership with community. You know, similar to what Nancy was talking about, it's not research on, it's research with. It can't be good for, it's gotta be good with, right? Um, and so that was a, a, a foundational learning experience for me at probation because I was the person getting hot at the table like well What have you thought about and then when I was I turned around and I ended up being the person they were like well fine you do it And so then I had to lead that um, and it was really instrumental But you know seeing our, our law enforcement partners here chief Bo and assistant chief Kasner Just grateful for you being here right and because it, it talks to it speaks to the system perspective and, and the agencies that we have in the room also being partners in this work with community-based organizations in a way that I think doesn't always get written in print or doesn't always get lifted up as this is the core work of policing or the core work of doing probation. But it, it's got to be the core work of policing. It's got to be the core work of doing probation work because if you don't know your community, you can't serve your community. And so engaging community leaders like Urban Family, like CCYJ, like Community Pathways, right? And so this is my, I told you I was going to go for a monologue, but now I'm, I'm coming to you, Francisco, as you think about your role and, and the work that you do with Link and, and your long engagement with the organizations here, you know, how, how do you use that partnership and that collaboration to really improve outcomes for the young people that are on your, on your, on your cases, on your caseload? Oh, well. <laughs> Like I had mentioned earlier, I mean, I do try, I try my hardest to let young people's um, youth, is what I call them, youth, um, on my caseload, if I know that they're working with a community partner, I'm messaging them for, versus email, versus text, saying, hey, it might be a completely last minute. Um, I will, I haven't in a long time, but I will go out into the community with a community provider if, if needed, um, just to check up. Um, I will say that I'm working with a young person. I actually, I just transferred him, but I had his older brother on my caseload for many years. Um, and the provider that had connected me with him got me kind of the in with that, that um, with him as well as his like group. Oh, me. 
it's so it was really really hard to transfer him but I mean I don't know if I can if any probation officer really could get a community partner the way that I have collaborated with them they would be it would make your job so much their job so much easier and some people fight it but honestly I would just say keep pushing them because you are more important in their life than you will see them beyond probation and I say that when I say hey I'm doing a referral for uh, link I will tell them they are going to be with you beyond the point of me like I'm just here for a couple a little bit and then your probation's here for a year you got them forever um, you can call me but I, the, I, the, this is the only thing I tell kids, and obviously I'm still here, so I haven't. But I will tell the kids, I will be here until I win the million dollars, mil, the lottery. Mm -hmm. And obviously I'm going on 20 years, so I'm still here. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if, that's my one piece of advice for any community partner. If you know a youth that is on probation, push that probation officer. Um, reach out to any, to Link if you need to, and they'll connect you with me and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you numbers to, I'll give you court dates. I don't mind, but we need those voices, those extra voices in the courtroom. Thank you. You know, there's something you said there. I've got them for a year. You've got them forever, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, the fact of the matter is, especially when we're talking about young people, but even when we're talking about emerging adults, 18 to 24, or adults who've had contact with the system, the vast majority of people after they come in contact with the justice system, stay in communities. And for those who do go into the deep end of the system, whether it's juvenile placement or jail or prison, guess what, they're, they're coming home too. And so as we think about how do we engage with those most at risk for involvement in or at risk for victimization of gun violence, those closest to some of the problems that we're trying to address, it can't be a punishment only philosophy because we've got to engage those people in the best possible way and give them a better path because we've got them forever, right? We've got them forever. Even if you take somebody off the street for a small period of time, that's a snippet of time. We've got them forever. And so what does engagement in their life looks like that really brings the type of pro-social behavior and ideally leadership that we want to see so that they're helping uh, the next generation of young people or even their own generation, right, make better decisions? So, Mark, we've, we've talked a bit about why CVI is so important, how it's a critical complement to a traditional law enforcement approach, how, in my opinion, and the Department of Justice comprehensive approach to reducing violence uh, is a central pillar mm -hmm. of a community safety infrastructure. But we haven't talked in depth about what is CVI. Can you take us through a little bit about what, wh how does your program work? What is CVI um, from your perspective? And Give us an example of how you know this is this is making a difference. Yeah. Um, so, under the leadership of the great Dom Davis. Um, <laughs> yeah, the great Dom Davis. Yeah. Um, it's 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 really a, a collection of adults that are indigenous to their community that actually care. Care enough to keep showing up even when the youth, um, the young people um, are stuck in their ways and are running away from you. Uh, they coined the phrase these days, relentless engagement. Um, so that's meeting them where they're at. Not waiting on them to come to you, but going to their house, going to talk to that mother listen to her cry about her baby, going to meet with him down in the juvenile or in the jail cell, talking to him, coming up with a plan, and then him coming out and maybe disappointing you and still showing up for him after that or her. Um, the secret sauce is relationship. Can't do, in, can't do anything in this work without relationship. And oftentimes, as we all were, like, we're stuck in our adolescence. We're stuck in our, in our teen thoughts. And we don't, we don't think that what we're doing is wrong. We're just trying to survive. Dad might be in jail. Mom might be working. 
might be no food in the house. I got influences outside, my friends. I'm outside, and I'm surviving the best way that I know how. And so when Mark, he pulls up on us on the block, Mark, I'm not trying to hear that. Go get a job, I'm not trying to hear that. Well, let's start a business. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'll meet with you on Tuesday. Be there. And they're not there. And so I call his friend because I got everybody's number. Where are you guys at? Oh, we're at the park. And I'm pulling up. And we're going to sit there. We're going to have a conversation about what they really want in their life. And they're going to see that no matter where they're at, I'm going to pull up. Um, we have examples, actually, um, in this space of, of this work actually working. We have, we have people that are uh, part of, we have employees that are part of Urban Fam that I used to pull over, do U-turns, hop out in the middle of the street, um, <laughs> tell them to get in the car, <laughs> take them to go get something to eat, and they're back outside fighting tomorrow. And guess what? Tomorrow I'm going to pull up, bust a U-turn, <laughs> uh, and do the same thing. Um, we also have a great example sitting in the front row. Um, and Trey, who started off as one of the young people that everybody was trying to chase down. Um, and Trey ended up working with me. I was a supervisor where he gave me hell. Um, <laughs> um, at Alive and Free. But to watch Trey's maturation and him go from this, this young kid with all this energy who ne didn't necessarily know where he was going then to grow into one of the best outreach workers I've ever seen in my life. And now to serve. <laughs> and, and as the kids say, that's no cap. That, <laughs> that's truth. Um, but to watch somebody with the same passion that I had go out there and serve, and now to be at CCYJ and be connected to this full ecosystem, that's how we know it works. Man, so much to pull out of that. The fact that you know they're going to disappoint you. In your job, as the responsible adults who have said, this is the work I'm going to do with my life, is to show up again the next day. You know, the um, adolescent brain doesn't finish developing until you're about 25, especially for males. Yeah. So we think about 18 as this magic age. We're like, oh, you, you should have your stuff together now. It's like, well, it's not, really, it's not really how it works biologically, right? And so that's not to excuse behavior from people who are less than 25. And you talked a lot about, uh, about a lot of things, Mark, about <clears throat> things that a young person might be dealing with in real time, and they're just trying to survive the best way that they know how. Again, that doesn't excuse actions they may take that harm others. Mm -mm. But it gives us some insight into their behavior. It gives us some insight into where they're coming from. And so that relentless engagement that you talked about, right, that willingness to show up over and over and over again, even after they disappoint you, in hopes in a, with the intention of preventing harm to themselves or to others from occurring. I mean, that, that's how you save lives, sure. right? You, you literally prevent that thing from happening by engaging that young person, whether they're a 16-year-old or a 24-year-old, over and over and over again. Paul, can you, can you, you know, I know you've got lots of examples, and Chantel, you, you shared one with us earlier. But can you share another example of how you know the work that you're doing day in, day out is making an impact on people's lives? <laughs> um, my inspiration this morning was the word compassion. Um, and compassion to me is entering into the suffering of someone else and knowing their story. Um, there's even a saying that says uh, an enemy is someone's story you do not know. 
Um, the way I know this is working is because I know the stories of my community and my work. Um, I know the story of Tori and Jamani. Um, Tori, Tori's biggest advocate is Grandma Lola. Grandma Lola is the glue to their family. Grandma Lola's up there in age, but she's a feisty something. <laughs> and she is, she ha has demonstrated relentless engagement of her grandsons. She's great grandmother, right? Um, Jamani. I uh, talked to him this morning. He came. He's a new hire. My brother came in flip flops. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, he's Jamani. Like, he went off script. He's <laughs> like, no, no, hold up, hold up. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. This, I'm going there. He, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. But, but, but Jamani's story. He's one of the smartest kids in his neighborhood. He can hold conversations at any level. When I went to pick up Jamani when he was released uh, from the juvenile detention center, went to pick Granny Lola up, got her a fish fillet or something that she wasn't supposed to be eating. She made me pick up anyways. But uh, I come to Woodenville because he's at school. While he's locked up, they have him participating in football, high school. Come to the front office, first thing Lay says is, you're Jamani Owens' mentor, aren't you? <laughs> and then the, the, the next second, hey, you're Jamani, like his name was ringing in the whole school. This is the same kid that is a general in his neighborhood gang. But they don't know him like that. Police don't know him like that. How is it possible that this young man is known in one space, the whole school is singing his praises, right? And then in the neighborhood that he's from, there are no opportunities. He has more opportunity to buy a gun than he is to get a summer job. There's more opportunities for him to get drugs than there is opportunities for him to do right. And so understanding and knowing where they come from, knowing their story, entering into their suffering and their pain, the reason why I know this works is because they are the fruit of our labor. This labor of love, urban family, over 75% of, of our, of our uh, workforce are kids that we have been walking with for years. We planted those seeds years ago. But thank God, those seeds are starting to come into fruition. And the same guy that showed up in flip-flops is gonna change the world. Is gonna change the world. That's how I know it's working. Jemani, you didn't know you were going to be a focus of this panel. No. <laughs> I, listen, I, I, tried not, I tried not to. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I, I, tried, I tried not to on purpose. <laughs> we appreciate you. Proud of you. So, uh, Billy, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to you. Um, uh, there's obviously a lot of good stuff that's happening right now in the CBI space. This is, a, this is sort of a watershed moment nationally for a community violence intervention where it's part of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, right? One of the only pieces of gun-related legislation in 30 years, and CVI had funding in it. Um, we've gotten annual appropriations from, from a bipartisan set of Congress outside of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act uh, two years in a row, um, three years in a row, excuse me. Uh, so that's, that's a big recognition from, from Capitol Hill. You've got a Department of Justice that has said this is a pillar of our work. Uh, and we are going to implement it with fidelity by listening to the field and credit to Eddie and so many others who have, who have been around the country 
constantly to hear from the experts, to hear from you all. Um, and, and obviously, Eddie brings his experience having run CBI programs in Chicago, but making sure that our work was first and foremost informed by your work, right? So this is, this is I think, in a, in a lot of ways, a watershed moment, um, but it's also a critical moment where we have to take stock and say, okay, where, do we, where does CBI go from here? How do we make sure that this isn't a fad or a trend, um, but this is ingrained as a, as a really core part of the way we advance safety in our communities, um, in good times and in bad times, right? We know numbers fluctuate, and I talk about numbers, but we're talking about people's lives. We know that we, as much as we are trying to prevent a single homicide because we don't want to lose a single person to violence, we know that some, we're not there yet, I'll say it that way. And unfortunately, we know that the numbers of people who die go up and down uh, as much as we try to, and we're near historic lows. I know in Seattle we've got, uh, we're on a good trend this year, um, but it's been, it's been a bumpy few years. And so, um, given that CVI has to be ingrained as part of our robust, comprehensive response to community violence. It can't be a year-to-year -year decision. So given, given that sort of lead-in, what do you think are the most promising areas for growth for the CBI field? And what, if you had to say, one or two challenges or concerns you have uh, on the horizon for the field? I would say my, my first concern is that you asked me the hardest question uh, out of all the last six questions. Uh, no, um, that's a great question. So just let me make sure I'm hearing it right. It's like, what, what are things that are areas of growth and then what are things that are maybe concerning? So when we think growth, we're thinking strength-based, right? Like, where are we? Like opportunities for us. Uh, man, well, uh, I would say one of the amazing opportunities here is we have some of the most um, amazing people in the space and the work, man. When we think of our continuum of care, when we think of our the SK money and we think of our young people and our emerging adults, um, we have organizations all the way through the whole continuum. So we have kind of the intervention, the prevention and the uh, restoration piece kind of really kind of kicking off here. I think uh, opportunities or areas of growth is we, um, we kind of see ourselves as CCYJ um, as a convener and a collaborator. We um, very much understand that our work is grounded in our ability to have relationships, right, and, and, and collaborate with, with community and systems. I'd say an area of growth is, is us finding better ways to do that um, uh, and better ways to bring more folks into the fold and be more inclusive because there are so many people um, that are doing great work that just aren't all connected um, in, in, in the web of support that, that, that we could do. And I think that would uplift uh, our community in an amazing way. Uh, I know you've mentioned Seattle several times, but really like we do work in Seattle, right? But like this is a collective that does work throughout the county, right? And where we're really hurting is in Seattle and South King County. And a lot of these organizations overlap, man, uh, multiple school districts, multiple jurisdictions, law enforcement, all of that kind of stuff. So figuring out better ways to just be more inclusive and in, cl in, in collaboration of both systems and community partners uh, is definitely kind of an area of growth. Uh, always an area of growth is, is, is how do we find ways to functionally fund the work um, where it's not, like you said, a one to two your thing but where is our line item funding where is our this is what we do um, and it's there every year and it's always consistent and we know how to um, we know what those numbers are going to look like year to year and, and, and we can prepare and prep for those things I would also say as we talk about that line item funding and when we talk about a community uh, ecosystem and a public health approach when we look at law enforcement uh, and their funding in that like n not necessarily reducing their funding but the way they receive their funding is up front, right? Whereas all of our community-based organizations have to do their funding by fundraising, having money, doing the work for free, and then being reimbursed for it, right? So how do we become uh, or, or, or structure our process so that uh, our, our community-based organizations can receive their money the same way probation does and law enforcement and things like that so they can be more um, proactive in how they do the work? And when we talk about that uh, training piece and that professional development piece, um, having a baseline for all of our organizations for um, 
toolkit so we all know that whether it's community passageways and rpkc work or whether it's pro se potential and link work right like all of our young people are getting the same support and same services as far as what the outreach workers bring so i'd say those are kind of our areas of growth are we doing some of that right now like absolutely right um we have great collaborations we have people like mark uh that uh is constantly a headache for me it tells me no all the time for everything but then brings everybody to the table and makes sure everybody gets the training and makes sure everybody on the same page and whether that's his organization or even him reaching out to other organizations um, and, and, and bringing them to the table. So we're, we're working on that as, as a community, um, but definitely we could lean into the knife more there and be better. Um, and then what was the second part of that? Did I get them both? Uh, I talk fast, so I'm trying to, trying to rip and run, so yeah. You got them both. So um, I know we got started a few minutes late on this part of the conversation, but we're gonna end on time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw one more question out uh, to the group, it's actually I'm going to give you a choice on question, and then I'll and then I'll wrap us up here at the end. Mark, I'm, I want to come to you first, um, and we'll we'll go to the, down the line this way. Um, so you get to choose which question to answer. Either, what is your hope or vision for CVI as we look towards the future, mm -hmm. or what more can can policymakers be doing to support the work that you're doing? Policymakers could be us. It could be local policymakers. What do you need from government to support your work? Choose either one. Um, I th I think I think um, like I can answer both of them. Um, like well, one answer. Um, we need sustainability. We need to be earmarked. We need to be funded. Um, for as long as it takes. Don't ask me to go outside, do the relentless engagement with a young person who has 18 years of trauma, and you want me to unpack all this trauma and help him heal in a year, in six months. Um, it's 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 to a point disrespectful to the human life, to the trauma that he's went through or she's went through all her life. It's disrespectful to us as being the humans who actually care about that life and want to do the best that we can, but we only have this limited amount of time, so we're trying to race through, and we actually just want with integrity to serve that, that young person in, in, in him because we see ourselves in them. And so it's, it's just sustain, sustainable funding. How do, we, how do we, again, get it earmarked, make sure that it's respected, um, and it can last. And so we, we actually can see um, like real change in our communities in the next 10, 15, 20, and 30 years. And we're not still doing the same work that me and Eddie have been doing all this time. We still shouldn't be at baseline. At some point, if you water something, it should grow. So there may be a lack of water. I really like that. And I, and I like that you're saying, like, you know, to what continue to water something. My biggest, and I shout this all the time, say to Billy a number of times, uh, I think collaborating. I wish the, pe the people that are giving the money, the higher ups are seeing what people are actually doing, whether it's probation, whether it's the community partner, like actually speak to them, um, you know, get to know what they're doing. I mean, there's such a misconception, I think, of what community partners may be doing, what probation may be doing, but ask those questions and just try to get, you know, collaborate. Because that is the only way I think it's going to be successful in some way or other. Um, but yeah, I do love your answer, so I'm gonna keep mine short. Thank you. Um, appreciate the question. Um, I wanted to first uh, do real quick um, and take the liberty to, Angela Mose, can you please stand up? Daryl Powell, uh, uh, Jaguna, and then the Bethias. One up. Um, these are the board members that, well, some of our board members that help make power the work 
And so I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, it's a very selfless job, but these guys uh, do incredible work and they're very successful in their own personal um, careers, but they help to power this work. Uh, round of applause. Thank you guys for showing up. Um, so innovation, innovation, reimagining systems, uh, being thought partners and bringing us into space so that we can help reimagine how things could be. Uh, thank you for that, as a, as a, a seed planted. Um, I think that when, when, when it's done like that, um, more things can happen, right? More things can happen, and so um, one minute, <laughs> one minute, um, and then I also this is off script, but uh, hiring people who can hear us that are from us, uh, Eddie. Thank you, man. You make us feel at home, even though you know. And so being able to hire people that look like us that share our story. Um, that can code switch, White House, let's go. Um, and, 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 but bringing us together, the, the, the philanthropic community, um, uh, uh, law enforcement, um, spent time at a coffee shop, and this is the biggest thing, and I'll leave you this, this is a seed planet, right? Stop starting with the deep end of issues. We're gonna end world hunger. Get everyone that works in world hunger to the table. You start at the deep end, it never works. Start at the shallow end with their name, uh, how they grew up, their story. I spent, um, um, I spent time at a coffee shop with someone who was completely different from me. He was a uh, former captain, police, we clearly had different ideas of public safety. Um, and it showed up at a community meeting. Instead of just staying enemies, invited him to coffee. And for 30 minutes, we talked about everything but what we came there to talk about. And we found more in common than we did that we didn't have in common. And that was the gift of that moment, is that we didn't start off with all this heavyweight stuff, but we leaned in. It takes more time. It's definitely the longer route, but it is the right route. It is the human route. So, thank you. Well, what were my options? What were the questions? I, I got lost with Paul. Paul gets going, I just zone in. I'd be like, hey, I'm dropping so, jewels. So, I so, so, it, so in just about one minute, um, either your vision or hope for CVI or what you need from us. Well, obviously, we need more money from you, so if you could sign the check today, that would be awesome. Um, but no, uh, structurally, I mean, my, my hope is, is, is similar to kind of like Mark, like one, how do we fund it, but two, like how do we build better collaborations, right, and how do we better serve our young people, one, right, and that's the foundational piece, right, that's the mission, how do we serve the young people, but also how do we serve the young people that are serving the young people, right, so we can continue the work, right, so... Um, really when we think about it, how is it sustainable, right, like, and how do we build it versus not just off funding, but like, what are the processes to keep it functional? Like, are we serving the people that serve the young people so that way they can show up and be elite um, in their passion? Um, and I look forward to finding ways creatively with you guys, uh, you know, hopefully in DC while I'm waiting for Eddie to come home, come back from the White House uh, and we can hang out in your cool office or whatever. But uh, again, but uh, just really finding ways to be creative with uh, both the systems folks and community folks and uh, state and uh, local folks to how do we serve the people um, that are doing the work so they can show up at the best. Sure. Thanks, Billy. So I've, uh, so tomorrow, um, tomorrow we are anticipating and expecting the president to announce the next round of CVI uh, awards. Uh, the work that we have done so far, uh, we're extremely proud of it. We're extremely proud to support partners like CCYJ and and Urban Family and so many other organizations across the country, either through direct awards or through sub awards. Um, but we're far, we know we are far from done because there are still people who are losing their lives and therefore our work is not over. Um, and what that work looks like, it requires us to have a comprehensive, comprehensive approach 
to reducing violence. Um, and that includes CBI as a central pillar of that work alongside our support for traditional uh, law enforcement approaches to this work. And so uh, we're excited and looking forward to tomorrow's announcement where uh, we anticipate new awards being announced for the FY24, meaning that we can bring more support to more communities across the country and to really build on some of the work we're seeing at a local level, including right here in King County. Um, and so please join me in thanking uh, this panel, first and foremost. Please join me in thanking uh, the organizations who have hosted us here today and all of our partners, uh, whether they're direct grantees or not direct grantees, whether, uh, but folks who are just doing this work here locally, all of you, huge thanks for the work that you're doing here in King County. And finally, let me just say what an, what an honor and a privilege it has been to share space with you all. Uh, to hear about the work that you're doing, the approach that you take. Uh, it's not the same, and yet there are so many similarities in saying, how do we get what's best for that young person and help lift that young, people, th that young person out of their, their worst mistakes or perhaps their, uh, their current situations? And I just have such a tremendous appreciation for the work that you do, for the work that all of you do, uh, and grateful that we're able to do this nationally because of what's happening locally in places like here. Thank you everybody for joining us today.